Whatever else you want to say about it, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has certainly generated some interesting claims on the internet. Spend too long on the internet and you'll be treated to all sorts of weird and wonderful things, ranging from American biological warfare uh, research in Ukraine, through to Ukrainian pilots who can shoot down the entire Russian Air Force in an afternoon, through to this gem where the Russians claimed, and I'm sorry to my UK viewers, but I'm reliably informed that you're now all on the brink of cannibalism due to the starvation flowing out of this conflict. My point is that the online environment has proliferated myths and claims faster than anyone could ever possibly hope to debunk them. Now, because of limits of time, I'm only going to be able to talk about a selection of myths that have been suggested to me by patrons and others, which I've grouped into five categories. We're going to start with the funny, the crazy, the conspiracy. We're going to talk about biolabs and a couple of other out there claims. Then we're going to go into economics and a number of the issues that have been raised there. After looking at economics, we're going to talk about some elements of battlefield performance that have had some myths or at least question marks raised about them. The point of game changes, which is a personal pet peeve around the way that the war has often been covered. And then finally, the all according to plan myth, which is sort of like the big and substantive one that I'm going to deal with last. This is tellingly the myth which includes under its heading the famous Kiev was a faint. A few points right up front. Firstly, these are obviously mostly but not entirely focused on Russia. I think that's just a product of the fact that these have been patron and subscriber suggested for the most part, although I am going to try and look at additional myths in the future with a greater focus on Ukraine. And obviously, this is not exhaustive. I'm limited by the fact that I am just me. I am one Australian on the internet. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm not an investigative journalist. I'm certainly not an intelligence agency, so I'm doing the best with the resources I have available. I will say straight up front that I'm specifically not covering claims around war crimes, fascism, Nazism at the moment. And I think there's a couple of good reasons to do that. The first is in the case of war crimes, competent authorities are going to investigate those. Those are under investigation in an active war zone. I have no access to that war zone. So I don't think my speculation or commentary from the side is particularly valuable. Around the issue of Nazism and the role of ultranationalism in this conflict, honestly, I think if I ever cover it, it's going to be its entire own video topic. But again, I'm not sure I'm the right person to be dealing with that particular topic. Now, finally, before we get into it, given the nature of this topic, it has so much to do with false claims and narratives and limitations of media echo chambers and environments and the importance of good information, I did think it was a good opportunity to welcome back a returning sponsor, Ground News. If you've followed me for a while, you will know that I am deeply suspicious of both clickbait headlines and ideological echo chambers when it comes to reporting. Ground News is a news aggregation and comparison website and phone app that tries to get around that problem. What it allows you to do is look at headlines that are emerging and compare the coverage uh, of various journalistic organizations at different points on the ideological spectrum to identify blind spots and to compare coverage. It also gives you a lot of additional information as well. If you're dealing with news websites that you're not familiar with, Ground News has got information on their historical slant and have done the evaluation work for you to an extent. They also provide a raft of additional information, like what the ownership structures of certain organizations are. Are they government news networks? What's their historical uh, factual accuracy rating? It also lets you go further, I think, and interrogate a little bit about your own media consumption habits. So if you're studying stories on, say, the Ukraine crisis, for example, you identify whether or not there might be gaps in the coverage that you're consuming that are telling you the story that you want to see rather than the full spectrum of information that's out there. So while I don't think this can solve the problem of media polarization overnight, I think it's a valid attempt and a tool that tries to fight back against that phenomenon. So if you're interested, ground.news slash Perun is the link for checking out the product. My thanks again to the people for Ground News uh, for sponsoring me today. All right, so some of the myths and ideas I talk about today are going to be pretty serious and require major evidence to discuss, and others are a little more out there. And as an Australian, I feel obliged to talk about the crazy shit first. So here we go, everyone's favourite scheme, the Biolabs and Tucker Carlson. Thank you, patrons, for nominating this. This was by far the most message topic for me to discuss. So the basics of this claim, if you haven't heard it before, is essentially this. America was running a secret offensive biological weapons program in Ukraine designing diseases that target Slavs that would be sent into Russia using migratory birds in order to destroy Russia. The follow-on to this is that they then tried to destroy all the evidence when Russia moved in to remove this clear and present danger to the people of the Russian Federation. A little bit of background, this story actually first gained traction in English-speaking media not in the Russian-speaking media first. It only later hit an inflection point after it was starting to be echoed on both the far right and far left in American politics in particular, that it hit that inflection point where there were more Russian language posts on the internet about it than there were in English. 
The basic accusation here hinges on a few points, and the Russians have gone so far as to take this one to the United Nations. So here is the basic argumentation. There were biological uh, research labs in Ukraine. They contained samples of dangerous pathogens, things like anthrax, tularemia, I believe. The next part of the claim is that these were American labs controlled by the American Department of Defense, that there was also some research into migratory birds going on, that there were lots of, quote, Slavic biosamples present at a number of these labs, and that when the war broke out, there were instructions to destroy these pathogens, which was a clear sign of a cover-up. The basic claim here is that clearly all of this points to a secret offensive biological warfare program. And the first thing to say is that most of the Russian evidence, and I encourage you to go see the evidence that the Russians have submitted in public and to the United Nations, doesn't really seem to suggest an offensive bioweapon program at all. It shouldn't be surprising to people that labs that were researching pathogens would have pathogenic samples on them. I mean, if you raided a Pfizer vaccine research facility and found copies of, say, the flu virus, the logical conclusion is probably that perhaps they were working on vaccines for the flu, you know, like the facility is meant to, as opposed to, oh no, Pfizer has planned to kill us all with some super engineered strain of influenza. And as for why a lab in a Slavic country with an overwhelmingly Slavic population might be using, I don't know, Slavic biosamples for things like testing, um, your guess is as good as mine. I think it has something to do with the fact that a Ukrainian lab probably gets most of its samples for testing from Ukrainians, and Ukrainians are generally Slavs. In terms of the American connection, there's something called the Biological Threat Reduction Program, which, yes, comes out of the United States Department of Defense which goes into nations and provides economic and intellectual support for countries in order to reduce the risk of outbreaks of really dangerous diseases. Now, I don't know if anyone's noticed a recent global outbreak of disease that caused some problems, but but the basic concept here is that an outbreak beginning in one country may provide a threat to other countries, and so it makes sense to provide assistance to actors around the world. In a similar vein, the United States once provided support to Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union to help secure its nuclear weapons arsenal, make sure those didn't fall into the wrong hands and cause some really bad things to happen. So the idea here is to prevent outbreaks and also to control the proliferation of dangerous agents and technology. With regards to the supposed cover-up, so the Russians here claim the World Health Organization issued advice to destroy these pathogens, and this was to, this was to cover up an offensive biological warfare program in Ukraine. I kind of hope that the WHO would issue those sort of instructions because you know what sounds like a really good idea after a pandemic? Maintaining really infectious and dangerous agents in labs in a place where bombs are going off on a regular basis. So basically most of the evidence for an offensive biological warfare program comes down to the fact that there was a extremely public biological threat reduction program in place. But look, All of this could be falsified in terms of counter evidence. All of this could be untrue. The reason I really want to throw this out is because it just makes no bloody sense. I mean, why? Just why? And there are different versions of this myth, but the best one is the idea that they were trying to perfect diseases that were specifically going to target Russians. And that was why they had lots of Slavic biological samples. Now, I don't know how to tell you people this, but If you could somehow convince a biological agent to differentiate between ethnicities, if you look at Ukrainians and you look at Russians, yeah, unless there's sort of a kamikaze spirit in the entire Ukrainian population, the whole concept just doesn't make much sense. The next point that doesn't make any sense at all is is positioning, how the nations ostensibly carried this program out. Remember, Both America and the USSR had Cold War biological warfare programs, which we know a fair amount about. Where did they put them? Well, the Soviet one was based in a number of locations, but one of the key research labs which eventually had an anthrax leak was in, what was at the time, Svedlovsk, which is now Yekaterinburg, which I would love to visit one day. It seems like a lovely place. But if you look at the map there, what strikes you about the position of what was at the time Svedlovsk? It's not exactly on the border or somewhere vulnerable to foreign spies or infiltration. Similarly, the United States didn't exactly station their research facilities in far-flung allies. Fort Detrick was the main research hub, and that's just outside Washington, D.C. I guess my point is, if you're the United States and you want to run a secret biological warfare research program, 
Why on earth would you house it in Ukraine, a country with a systemic problem of Russian intelligence infiltration on the Russian border? It just makes no bloody sense. The entire idea is nuts. I don't know why it started. My personal theory is that it gained some traction and then the Russians saw an opportunity to amplify it in order to complicate the information environment. But it's just batshit and it makes no sense. The second batshit idea that there is the reason that Russia has had some difficulties in Ukraine is because there are literally tens of thousands of NATO special forces operators in Ukraine launching operations to make life hard for the Russians. Now, let's be clear, this is not an idea in the the mainstream Russian propaganda stream. This is an out there product of the internet, but nonetheless, it has in some places obtained some traction with people claiming numbers as high as 20,000 NATO Special Operations Forces operators killed by the Russians. In fact, some uh, like Pavel Fakula here, who I believe is actually an American pro-Russian troll, suggests that more NATO Special Operations Forces have been killed than Russian troops in operations in Ukraine to date. I'm not sure how to rebut this other than to say that people would probably notice uh, 20,000 NATO Special Operations Forces troops going missing. For context, US SOCOM was only about 63,000 strong in 2021, and that's that's pretty all-inclusive. I doubt even Pavel here thinks the Americans are sending Civil Affairs Brigade to go C4 Russian tanks in the Donbass. Like, I find that rather unlikely. So let's take this commentary around the idea that Russians are literally, as one person argued here, getting tired of killing Ukrainian and NATO special operators. And the debate around further offensive actions mirrors the discussions around ending high school games early under slaughter rules. Let's just leave this all aside and treat it as sufficiently dealt with. Are there probably CIA spooks in Ukraine? I would be incredibly surprised if there aren't. But 20,000 guys playing out video game fantasy c 4 in tanks? Not so much. Anyway, something a little more serious. Let's talk about economic topics. And the first one of which is German aid. This was a very popularly requested one. The video on Germany, German rearmament, German support for Ukraine, that's very much overdue, but it is now finally in production. But I thought I'd deal with one element of the the claim now. The question of, is Germany pulling its weight? Is it providing enough support? Because you see examples on both extremes, people saying, Germany is being useless and isn't doing anything, and people saying that Germany is being unfairly beat up, it's not doing anything wrong. Well, there's a few ways of measuring this, uh, and I rely on the uh, sources provided by the Institute for the World Economy, uh, Kiel, for my sources for this one. The first thing to say is that in terms of the total euro value of support packages paid or not paid, committed, Germany is the largest EU supporter in total euro terms. The place where it gets complicated is where you start talking about per capita efforts. So if you measure what Germany has pledged in terms of a percentage of its GDP, there it starts to lag behind countries like Denmark, the United Kingdom, France, obviously the US, Portugal, Slovakia, and very much behind Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Lithuania, and countries like that. The second thing is in terms of its military support specifically. So how many weapons Germany has pledged? Germany has actually pledged more weapons than, say, countries like France have, or Italy, or the Czechs. The weakness of the German support and the bit that's been criticised is whereas countries like, for example, Poland have delivered pretty much all of what they pledged, or the UK who's delivered most of what they have pledged, German pledge deliveries are only a small fraction at this point of their overall commitments. So like the first Panzerhalbitzen are arriving and are in service now. So in evaluating this one, I guess it really depends on what you value. Do you value the total number of euros given or what percentage of a country's wealth it's committing? Do you value how many weapons will get there eventually or how many weapons have made it in quick time already? In any case, I do hope to go into this topic in more detail when I do my Germany video. But for now, I think that's a reasonable summation of German support to date. It's a mixed story and it basically comes down to what you value most. The second point I wanted to talk about was this claim that all of Ukraine's economy is in the Donbass region. And that's why the the combat in the Donbass is so decisive. Usually those two points link together. The argument goes that Ukraine can't survive without the Donbass, therefore the fight in the Donbass must be decisive. I've got this Twitter comment here, uh, which is just the first one I found on this area. They're saying the Donbass and the occupied area 
represents 75% of Ukraine's economy, so it's a pretty big deal. And then you say that if you add Odessa, it adds 90% of Ukraine's economy and Ukraine becomes irrelevant as a country. So this feeds this idea that by taking the Donbass, Ukraine is no longer economically viable. And as a result, Russia basically accomplishes its goal, ostensibly, of demilitarizing the country or reducing it to a husk. It's used for several reasons, actually. Pro-Russians, I've seen, use this in order to justify a focus just on the Donbass and, and prove that that was the goal all along. Pro-Ukrainians use it in order to make arguments for liberating the territories of the Donbass as an absolute economic necessity rather than just a, a political or a moral one. So this is a, one, a rare case of something I've seen used on both sides. All right, so what do the numbers say? And for this, I've turned to the 2019 Gross Regional Product of Ukraine report, which is a Ukrainian government statistical publication, but not one that I have any reason to doubt the accuracy of in this narrow respect, noting that this is well after Donetsk and Luhansk were partially occupied by Russian proxy forces in 2014. So in 2019, the Donbass, or the part of the Donbass that Ukraine controlled, accounted for about 7.8 billion euros of gross regional output, which is the regional equivalent of gross domestic product. That's about 6% of Ukraine's GRP in 2019. By contrast, the, the city of Kyiv itself accounts for about a quarter of the Ukrainian economy. Now, there are other centres of economic importance out east, but they're not areas that Russia currently occupies or is immediately looking to occupy. So Kharkiv is important. Uh, Dnipro is important. Odessa, as the commenter identified, are very important. But these are not areas in the Donbass or in the far south outside Crimea where the Russians currently have significant land holdings. You would need to expand the scope of the Russian invasion significantly in order to say you're accounting for the majority of the economy of Ukraine. Certainly, if you want to claim you're accounting for 90%, as the commenter does. The other point here is I, I often find the theme here is that people who emphasize the importance of the Donbass uh, with its steel mills and factories and the Azov Star, which has now fallen in Mariupol after being destroyed, is a focus on the idea that manufacturing is somehow more worthwhile or more valuable as an economic activity than a service economy, which is the sort of thing you see more of around Kyiv. The thing I'd say to this is it really depends, right? It's perfectly possible to manufacture goods that are more likely to lose a market in a crisis than services. If you're going through a recession, for example, and you are sick, are you more likely to buy healthcare services or, I don't know, Jenga boards and Halloween costumes? It's perfectly possible to manufacture goods that have a market drop away that aren't real in the same sense that services like health or education are, that people will spend on even during hard times. So the summary of this myth is no. Um, the Donbass region is economically important for Ukraine, no doubt, but the Russian advance would need to go considerably further west to Dnieper, to Kharkiv, to Odessa, and probably even to Kyiv itself in order to truly knock out the Ukrainian economy in the long run. Okay, so now back to things that blow up. Um, two battlefield myths that I've been asked to revisit. The first is the idea of cannon fodder and casualties. Back towards the beginning of this war, I ran a video basically debunking the idea that Russia was sending in garbage troops and garbage equipment first and saving up their best stuff in reserve. Now, that remains true. The Russians did send in some of their very good units first, and there's no evidence that they kept substantial reserves of high-quality units in reserve. But what we do have evidence of since February and March is the increasing use of second-tier equipment and second-tier forces by both sides. The usage of what you could call cannon fodder formations has actually become more credible over time. For example, the so-called DPR has admitted more than 10,000 killed and wounded since the beginning of the fighting. Now, we talked about the, the DPR and the LPR in my infantry shortage video, and those casualties that are being admitted are mind-blowing. So if you adjust those for population, assuming the DPR has a population of about 2 million, it's hard to know exactly because of evacuations and population movements, etc. But adjusted for population, that's very approximately equal to the United States losing about 300,000 killed and 1.2 million wounded in a conflict, which is higher than the numbers for the Second World War. And then looking at the Russians, you've got an increasing use of volunteers and paramilitaries to supplement the regular military forces that went into Ukraine. So if you are a veteran, you did your conscript service at some point in the past, you can sign up on a three-month contract with the Ministry of Defense, or you can sign up with Roskvadia 
in Chechnya or you can sign up with Wagner Group. And most of these pathways result in you having a couple of days. Uh, the reports I've seen from the BBC are about a seven-day refresher training course, and then you're off on your way to Ukraine, being paid more in a month than many Russians will make in a year. Now, the BBC did do an investigation into these volunteers, particularly of confirmed casualties of those who've taken short-term contracts with the Russian MOD, and they found that about 57% of them were over the age of 40, 25% of them were over the age of 50. And these are the guys that are being pushed into service to try and help make up the Russian infantry numbers, along with the use of, say, Wagner and additional troops out of Roskvadia. Now, on the spectrum between high-speed low-drag elite special forces operator and cannon fodder, 50-plus-year-old infantrymen with seven days refresher training certainly trends more towards the right-hand side of that spectrum in my mind. On the Ukrainian side, we do have a lot more evidence now. There's been some good material put out by uh, Austrian commentators in particular showing evidence of territorial defense force units that are under-equipped and in some cases under-trained being pushed in to steady the line and hold positions, particularly in the Donbass, before you could say they're really ready for line operations. So overall, I would say the quality of the troops that we are seeing pushed into the line on both sides has degraded significantly in many cases. The quality of the equipment we're seeing pulled out of Russian reserves has declined. We're seeing older and older armoured vehicles. Not to say those armoured vehicles aren't useful for something, but the quality of the equipment and the quality of the manpower that we're seeing pushed to the front now has certainly declined. So whereas I would have called cannon fodder mostly a myth if, when I did this soon after the invasion begun, it's become increasingly credible and less of a myth. But of course, you don't need masses of infantry to win the war if you have aces and superheroes on your side. And I've been asked to talk a little bit about the claims there. Both sides have produced pretty wild claims of aces that have turned entire battles by themselves or gunned down legions of the opposition, or the famous Ghost of Kiev story where a single pilot apparently shot down 40 Russian jets. The basic status of these myths is as follows. Firstly, a number of them have either been admitted false by the sides claiming them, or the individuals involved have been confirmed killed. The Ukrainians admitted that the Ghost of Kiev is not a single pilot. Yes, the Ukrainian Air Force continues to fly sorties. There are a number of accomplished Ukrainian pilots. Some have passed away, some are still in action, but there is no single Ghost of Kiev. On the Russian side, there have been some high-profile losses. Uh, Russian Special Forces sniper Alexander Kalinsky was quite famous, very solid reputation in the force. He has been confirmed dead, and there was an obituary published for him. But in those cases where there is no confirmed obituary or there has been no official retraction, it's hard to say. There are still a number of cases that are uh, alive and active in the media. CNN covered the famous Ukrainian tank Bunny, which has claimed five Russian tanks and a number of APCs and IFEs. Now, given the choice, I still think most Australian farmers would rather deal with the tank than a bunch of rabbits, but I am not in a position to independently verify or comment on Bunny's kill claims. I expect given the scale of war, there are probably some legitimate high-performing units or individuals out there. This is a very large-scale conflict with hundreds of thousands of people involved. Just mathematically, you would expect there to be outliers, but in terms of actually confirming them, that's going to be difficult even long after this conflict is over. Ultimately, I'm going to leave things like Bunny in the question mark column. It's very easy for me to confirm things like the fact that the United Kingdom has not in fact collapsed into cannibalism or that Russian targeting anthrax samples carried by migratory birds is probably a batshit idea. It's harder for me to confirm the individual exploits of an individual tank fighting in eastern Ukraine. And now speaking of CNN and the media, that leads into the question of coverage. I was asked a number of questions around the quality of media coverage as I saw it on the Ukraine conflict, and one particular issue stuck out, which was that everyone wanted to know about how their favorite weapon system had performed in Ukraine. So I decided to group all these together under the topic of game changers. I think this is probably a topic or rather a product of the news cycle, but have you noticed how in the media, both Russian and Western, every new system introduced into the war seems to become a game changer? First, it was the Burutinos, the TOS-1As, which is the Russian thermobaric rocket launchers that were all the rage when yeah, in early March, the Russians were going to use these things and it was going to blow the Ukrainian positions wide open. Then it was hypersonic missiles. It was the BMPTs that went into Sverodonetsk and then we heard very little more about. It was the M777 artillery systems, and now it's the HIMARS rocket system. Now, every, each one of these systems has been described as if it is going to single-handedly 
change the tide of war. Indeed, the article I posted there literally says how Russia's Sirkon hypersonic missiles could turn the tide of the Ukraine war. It couldn't be more blatant. But reality is that usually these systems are introduced in very small numbers into a conflict which is operating on a very large scale. Systems can be helpful, but asking an individual rocket system, especially when they're introduced in small numbers, like, for example, four in the case of the, the high Mars rocket system, is a really big ask on an individual system. But of course, it gets worse because often this idea of game changers has been applied to singular individuals. There was at least a week of coverage in May where anyone could talk about was Alexander Dvornikov, the idea that the Russians had finally moved away from having multiple commanders of the different military districts, each controlling their own part of the Ukraine war. And now the, the butcher of Syria or the butcher of Aleppo, this new Russian general was going to come in, he was going to apply new tactics, and he was going to sort the whole thing out. By the way, he seems to have already been pushed out of command, so clearly that didn't go too well. And then there was the individual Canadian sniper. We actually had several days of new coverage uh, talking about the impact that a single man, Wally and his sniper rifle from Canada, was going to have on the war. And I think this is a problem with people growing up on too many action hero or superhero movies. If you dropped Captain America into the Donbass, he's probably eating a 125 millimeter shell to the face and going into the dirt. That's just the sad reality of modern warfare. We like to hunt for heroes and villains, individuals around which entire conflicts revolve. But the reality is that war with hundreds of thousands of people involved is a significant undertaking. It's got inertia. It's got scale. So just as introducing a couple of new systems can be helpful, switching out individual leaders or in some cases individual troops really often isn't going to move the needle particularly much on an overarching conflict. My verdict here is basically that while the media constantly hunts for and hypes game changes, what matters is usually big, boring, and sustained. It's how many dollars over how long a period are going in to support Ukraine. It's what is the total volume of weapons shipments that are coming out of Russian reserve. It's how many recruits are being raised in aggregate. What is the training pipeline on both sides? It's the hard economic and military factors rather than one man and his rifle or one Russian general coming in to try and sort everything. To all the gamers out there, I'm sorry, but Call of Duty has been lying to you. And the next point that I think leads off that is the idea that every day of this war has to be about a major change or a major evolution. This kind of makes sense when you consider the news cycle, because running a bunch of headlines that basically say, today is kind of like yesterday, and more things like yesterday happened again, um, and the war continues, is not really the most satisfying headline. It's not really the best way to grab clicks. So in exchange, we get hero weapons, we get nuclear threats, we get weeks where all we can talk about are MiG-29 fighter jets. There's always a major development seemingly always imminent, a critical battle, an offensive about to begin. The taking of individual villages and positions has become a major development that dominates a, a new cycle. The result of this is that it's very easy to get the sense that a lot of things have changed and that the entire narrative of the war has swung without the lines of battle actually moving that much at all. And as a result, it's the goalposts and the narrative swinging rather than the actual evolution on the battlefield. I'm going to talk more about this idea in our last myth of the day, but I put up a photo from a presentation. This is when I did it back in April where we were discussing, just as an example, what would happen if the Russians in their next phase of their operation were able to take Kharkiv, Dnipro, and Zaporizhia, and what that would mean for the Ukrainian war effort. If you think now, in June, what we're actually talking about is conflict taking place in the far east corner of the Ukrainian-held territory of the Donbass instead. And yet, the narrative of the war has changed significantly. Like I said, we'll come back to that in a bit. But first, I need to open a can of worms on the myth that was requested far more than any others, the idea of basically how is it going? Specifically, is the Russian operation actually all going according to plan? Because as late as April, the uh, Russian media was still insisting that the special military operation was going exactly as planned and intended. And even now they're saying that, yes, there have been some reverses, but we're on track to achieve all of our goals in full. And I'll admit, I do this both under protest, but I also acknowledge that it is an important one to try and unpack, and I'm going to do my best here. The first thing we need to talk about when we decide whether or not Russia has actually been, you know, whether this is all going according to plan, is what was Russia trying to achieve in the first place? This is the key reason that I hate the who is winning question with such a burning passion. 
The answer to that question of who's winning a conflict depends on what you define as winning for both sides. What were they trying to achieve? If, for example, you say Russia's goal was regime change in Ukraine and its total occupation, then the invasion looks like an absolute colossal failure. If it was a wider challenge to NATO and the West, it's looking really shaky. But if the goal was just the occupation of the Donbass and the Crimean land bridge and then fighting a forever war against Ukraine until some negotiated settlement could be arrived at far down the line, then things look really, really different. So in order to decide whether or not things are going according to plan, you need to ask whether you think Russia intended a long war with relatively limited goals, or was it after a short, sharp war to achieve maximist objectives? And we've gone over this a little bit before, so I'm going to try and speed through it. In terms of determining what I believe the Russian goal was, we've talked before in previous videos about what I think is the near impossibility of proving exactly what the goal was, because none of us can get inside Vladimir Putin's head. But I do have a certain view of what the campaign was likely trying to achieve and some evidence for it. The way that the operation was conducted, Putin's call for a military uprising in Ukraine, the way they interacted with collaborators in Ukraine, some of the alleged leaks that have come out of the FSB, statements by DPR, LPR proxies, so Strokov, Gorokovsky, others, what POWs have said. You put all of this together combined with the practical challenge of the minimist objectives, and for that I'd point you to my previous episode, Who is Winning? All of this to me suggests that Russia was at least attempting in its early stage of its invasion to achieve a regime change, political takeover of Ukraine, and then either the political domination of the country or the partition of the country. But again, I can see that deciding on what the goal was or proving what the goal was is very, very difficult. So instead, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to pare this argument down the going according to plan myth, I'm going to pare this down to two very, very specific questions. The first is, was Kiev a feint? And secondly, what evidence do we have that the Russian plan, whatever it is, is or isn't going according to plan? So let's start with everyone's favorite, Kiev was a feint. To refresh everyone's memory, most of the videos that you saw in the media of the Russian-Ukrainian war in the early days were of the Northern Front. This was where the Russians poured tens of thousands of troops to attack the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv, but also attacked cities like Sumy and Chernihiv in the north of Ukraine. It was a massive military undertaking. This is where, if you remember the 14 mile or however long the media made it in the end convoy, this is that part of the front. Later on, after intense Ukrainian resistance, after getting as far as the suburbs of Kyiv, the Russian troops were all later withdrawn and redeployed to the east. Rather than characterizing this as a defeat, where the Ukrainians pushed back the Russian force that was overextended along its roads and suffering constant ambushes, some pro-Russian sources basically argue that Russia always intended to run away, and they present different reasonings and proof. I've got some choice examples here. One person saying the entire operation was conceptualized as a raid, not an offensive. They were there to kill people and break things. They did that. It was time to move on. Another claim from a person who also said that withdrawal claims were misinformation said that the Russian withdrawal near Kyiv sounds like negotiations were wrapping up and basically said that the Russians did this in order to give the Ukrainians a face-saving way to lead into peace negotiations. The Russians gave the Ukrainians a visible win so the Ukrainians could then surrender, arguing that they'd at least done their part. Obviously, that hasn't happened. And a number of other apologists basically argue that this was just about providing a distraction so that the Russians could seize their real objectives, Mariupol and the Crimean land bridge, which sounds like a post facto justification for the fact that they didn't seize their other stated objectives, the Donbass, while the Kyiv offensive was ongoing. Now, of course, you don't have to stop. If you are uh, a Russian apologist, you do not have to stop at the argument that Kyiv was a feint. You can argue that the Donbass offensive after Kyiv was also a feint. So the idea here is that if you're not happy with the level of success obtained in the Donbass offensive, you can argue that that too is a feint. I've got someone here arguing that the Donbass is just a feint because it was announced in advance. It's really obvious. And really, it's just providing a distraction so that the Russians can attack Odessa and Kharkiv, which obviously hasn't happened, but you could make this argument. I need to point out for fairness that this is not actually very popular with Russian mill bloggers. It's certainly not popular with Russian official media or the Donbass proxies like the DPR, LPR. But you know, it is funny. And indeed, you can take it to another level again. Because you see, if you're not happy with how any of the Russian offensive has performed, you can just argue that the entire war is a feint. 
And the idea is this is actually just a distraction from other things that Russia intends to do. The two arguments I were able to find here was one who says, in war, you have to look at the negative space on the map. What isn't happening right now? Ukraine seems like an economy of force operation by Russia. Why? I joked about little green men in Latvia earlier tonight, and now I wonder if I'm on to something. So basically, the idea that Ukraine is a distraction from Russia's real plan of potentially attacking the Baltic states. Another person arguing here that Russia started the war to find out who would side with it in a conflict and how they would help Ukraine and by how much, so that Russia had valuable information and knew how to strike when the, quote, real war starts. I assume that's a conflict with Ukraine. To be honest, at this extreme, this argument just depresses me. The mental gymnastics required are immense, and it basically it reaches the point where if you're willing to go this far and say the entire attack on Ukraine was just a feint for some other activity because you're not happy with how the progress goes, there is literally nothing that could happen up to and including Moscow being occupied that would convince you that things have not gone according to plan. The people who make these kind of arguments are the ones who are in Berlin in 1945 and are convinced that any day now, Steiner's counterattack is going to save Berlin from the Red Army, and then the Americans and the Western allies are going to join Germany and drive back into the Soviet Union. So I'm not going to focus on this extreme too much. We're going to get back to the core question. What evidence do we have to suggest that Kiev was or wasn't a feint? Because I hope this is the last time I ever have to look at this particular question until we're in the post-war period, and we can actually start cracking open some uh, documents from either side. And what I'll say here is that as far as a military operation goes, it doesn't look like a feint. It doesn't look like an economy of force operation. The idea with a feint would be to convince as many Ukrainian military forces as possible to remain around Kyiv while using and risking as few of your forces as possible. Maybe that would have meant posturing on the Belarusian side of the border. Maybe that would have meant um, artillery and limited attacks on the border regions in order to threaten Kyiv, but not in a way that exposed many of your forces. Instead, what we saw was an offensive carried out in a manner that looked like they were trying to do Crimea 2.0. The Russians rushed light forces and Roskvadia troops down the roads, avoiding major centers of resistance, and trying to basically just drive into areas and occupy them while avoiding major combat. They dropped the Vede there right on Hostomel Airport, maybe to try and set up a land bridge, an air bridge rather, or maybe to secure it until ground support could arrive. And meanwhile, there were reports of assassination attempts on Zelensky, appeals from Putin for the Ukrainian military and sympathizers to rise up and assist the Russians and overthrow the government. Remember, this is basically what the Russians were able to do in Crimea to an extent. They sent in light forces, elite operators, so special forces, maybe some Vedeve guys, move in, avoid combat with the main Ukrainian units, secure critical areas. And as a result, the war is over with a relatively limited amount of bloodshed. And by surging all these forces down these roads, outrunning their artillery, outrunning their logistics, outrunning their air defense, they exposed them to ambushes, artillery attacks, and allowed Ukrainian response forces and Ukrainian TDF to basically resist them. The other piece of evidence I advance is that the Donbass proxy, so the so-called DPR, LPR, people like Strelkov, Korkovsky, uh, Strelkov in particular, they describes how the immense efforts that the, the proxies went to in order to launch attacks in the Donbass in order to prevent the Ukrainians moving forces from the Donbass to Kyiv, which is the reverse of what you would expect if Kyiv was meant to be the distraction. If Kyiv was the distraction, the goal would be to have as many Ukrainian forces move out of the Donbass as possible. Instead, Strokov is saying they tried to keep as many Ukrainians as possible pinned down there. I do need to address one argument that comes up, and that's the argument that the Russians couldn't possibly have intended to take Kyiv because no reasonable person could expect to take Kyiv with insert however many men they claim the Russians used in the offensive, the number tends to decrease each time you run it. The idea is Kyiv is a city with several million residents, it's going to be very hard to take, and as a result, no sane person would launch an offensive aimed at knocking out the government and taking the city, using the forces that the Russians had available. My first counter-argument is, well, it worked in Crimea. Avoiding centres of military resistance, the Ukrainian army fell over, if the Russians believe the Ukrainians weren't going to resist, then the operation makes perfect sense. If you have bad political assumptions that the Ukrainians are mostly not going to shoot back, some of them are going to go home, some of them are going to change sides, maybe Zelensky is going to run away, the government's collapsed, maybe he'll be captured, maybe he'll be killed, then suddenly putting troops into the enemy capital on day one just seems like a sensible way to end the war quickly. So in other words, this doesn't mean it's a feint, it just means it's a bad plan. To quote one Russian commentator that I saw on YouTube, 
if this is going according to plan, then it's a shit plan. And I think I happen to agree. Kiev as a target uh, is capable of generating immense resistance. It's a city of several million people. So when you say the idea is to pin down Ukrainian forces, a lot of what the Russians were fighting in the offensive on Kiev weren't just regular Ukrainian forces that could have moved to the Donbass. It was militia. It was local volunteers. It was TDF. It was Pavel and his mates and, a, and an end law hanging out at night or setting a Stugner position and trying to ambush some Russian vehicles. Those forces couldn't have gone to the Donbass. And they couldn't have fought anywhere near as effectively in the Donbass as they did in the suburbs of the city that they knew and came from. So by going into Kyiv, the Russians didn't really pin Ukrainian forces so much as throw themselves straight into teeth of Ukrainian forces that could be quickly generated around Kyiv. And there's other reasons to think this was just a shit plan too. Russian losses in this offensive were highly significant. Feints are meant to be economy of force operations. Instead, many of the vehicles that have been destroyed or captured, many of the Russian losses that we saw, those happened in these northern offensives on Kyiv, on Sumy, on Chernihiv, on these areas, because when the Russians retreated, they left behind an awful lot of hardware and they were being ambushed in the lead up to that withdrawal process. At the same time, as I said, in the Donbass, there were casualties. As Strelkov says in the quote there from Telegram, all the blood spilled by the Donetsk and Luhansk residents in February and March, which did not allow the Ukrainians to pull their troops from the Donbass to near Kharkov and Kyiv, turned out to be in vain. And all of this in the context of an operation that really fired up the rest of the world and fired up the Ukrainians. The retreat from Kyiv was one of the defining elements of the international narrative. It's part of what helped convince many in the world that Ukraine was capable of winning. And in Ukraine, it was something that really fired up the residents of the country as well. This is just speculation, but I'm not sure if the response of the Ukrainians would have been different if the Russian offensive from day one had just been in the Donbass region rather than a wide spectrum offensive that threatened everything, including the capital. So to me, ultimately, the whole Kyiv was a faint argument basically feels like someone losing a sports match and then arguing, oh, no, bro, it's fine. I let you win. That was the plan all along. And speaking of the plan, where does that leave the wider question? Is the Russian war effort going according to plan? The Russians have asserted it has several times. Sergei Lavrov continues to push the idea that, you know, maybe there's been the occasional reverse, but mostly everything's going according to plan. Now, again, I I can't prove what the Russians were trying to achieve, but I've got some indicators that things probably aren't going according to plan. Some are more debatable than others. For example, you could point to very high Russian loss figures in terms of material, equipment, manpower. But maybe you could argue that the Russians always knew they were going to lose a huge amount of equipment and men, and that's fine. Other things are harder to justify if this was really what the Russians planned from the start. The first is the way they're going about building up their forces. If you know you're going into a long, grinding, attritional struggle, Pushing people for short three-month contracts who are over the age of 40 just to fill the gaps with seven-day refresher courses, really the best that you would come up with? Or would you instead have found an excuse to mobilize some reserve formations and made sure that you had a pool of trained manpower available to resupply your forces once they started taking casualties? Would you really be rushing to bring ancient tanks out of storage, rapidly refurbish them and get them to the front? Would you really be sending proxy forces in the DPR and LPR into battle, woefully under-equipped? Would you send your troops in without radios and night vision goggles and proper encrypted communications? Would your materiel situation really be that bad? Or would you have pre-arranged to have that materiel ready? After all, the Americans already knew that the Russians were planning to invade. The secret was already out. So you would think that the invasion having been compromised, Russia would have prepared for this sort of level of material expenditure if it expected it. Even if you insisted on secrecy and not telling troops at the front, would you not have at least quietly inspected your war stocks and made sure they were pre-positioned and ready to go so at least the units were in tip-top shape when they went in and were ready to quickly regenerate themselves once the fighting started? And then, of course, there's the question of the leadership purges. Now, militaries are not perfectly analogous with other organizations, but there are some basic rules they follow which are in common with business or politics, and that is usually you don't fire someone when they're doing a good job, and you usually don't arrest someone when they're doing a good job either. We've seen a lot of both on the Russian side. We've seen the massive restructuring of the Russian high command, so obviously when Russia began, each military district was running its own show, 
Now, the Russians tried to resolve that problem by appointing Alexander Vornikov as the single commander of the Russian offensive effort in Ukraine. But by many reports, the guy drinks a little too much, isn't popular with the troops, and is already on the outer. The FSB, the intelligence organization that was committed in Ukraine, that was giving Putin a lot of his intelligence about how Ukraine would respond, and that was allegedly spinning a lot of the stories around how there were political collaborators in Ukraine ready to change sides and the whole country would just collapse. So most of their responsibilities in Ukraine have been transferred to another organization. Something like 150 agents are reported to have been purged. Sergei Beseda is actually in prison. Uh, he was a former leader of the relevant section of the FSB. If Russian intelligence was doing their job, I'm not sure whether or not Putin would have arrested them and sent them all to prison. Just, just, just a hypothetical. I mean, make no mistake, sometimes you do fire competent military leaders. Hugh Dowding in World War II comes to mind, but at least they had the, the good sense to wait until after he'd won the Battle of Britain before they fired him. And it goes beyond the FSB. It goes beyond Dvornikov. Leaders are being shuffled constantly. I've just got a couple of examples here. Uh, Igor Osipov of the Black Sea Fleet, fired. Sergei Kiesel, First Guards Tank Army, fired. Andrei Sedyukov, commander of the Airborne Forces, the Vedev. Reportedly, he's been fired. This is reported in a number of places, allegedly because of the extreme casualties that the Vedev suffered at places like Hostomel. Now, if everything was going according to plan and he just suffered the casualties or the outcomes that were expected, firing him in the middle of a war doesn't seem like the logical sense. Really, it looks an awful lot like Putin's shuffling his deck of generals like a gambler dealing a deck of cards. And as an observer, I would need really compelling evidence to suggest this was for reasons other than the fact they are either A, performing badly, or B, planning on acting against him. And it seems unlikely that all of them were planning on acting against him at the same time. Indeed, it would be a huge coincidence if, while plotting their grand uprising against Vladimir Putin, they conspired to throw off suspicion by being as incompetent as possible on the field of battle and getting all their troops killed or ships sunk in the interim. So I take those elements as evidence that the Russian war plan really isn't going according to plan. Because if it was, they would have made better preparations and that we probably wouldn't be seeing the same churn in their leadership cohort. But of course, if you've been on YouTube for more than five minutes, you've seen the great counter argument here. And I don't want to sound too combative, but I see this a lot and I just wanted to address it. Just look at the map, they say. Whenever you raise a question around whether or not the Russian military's performance has been up to standard, whether it has performed as expected, or whether it's suffering problems, because remember, I never make judgments over who is winning this conflict. What I do is I investigate reasons behind apparent Russian or Ukrainian underperformance, or I use the war to illustrate concepts like the potential damage of corruption. And a lot of the counter arguments I see against my videos and others is the idea that if you just look at the map, it's clear that everything is going great for Russia. I've got a couple of comments here. Uh, so Map keeps shrinking, Russian military corruption less important than Ukrainian military corruption because Russia's winning. All you need to do is look at the map to know who is winning. Or perform poorly in Ukraine, question mark. Have you seen the live map of Ukraine lately, question mark. And finally, one factor alone causes my doubt, the map. The map shows an increasing amount of territory under Russian control. It doesn't. That's not true. <laughs> so what I've got here is a map of the Institute of Study of War map, which is not perfect, I admit, but it's the one I can use because I post one every day, so it's easy to compare. On the left is March 23, 2022. And then exactly three months later, June 23, 2022, which is the date of recording. This is the most recent map. What you will notice between these two maps is that Russia has made some gains in the east in Donetsk. So Mariupol has fallen. They've consolidated their positions to the north there, um, and they've expanded their holds, particularly uh, well, to an extent in Luhansk and also in Donetsk. But they have withdrawn entirely from their holds around Kiev, around Chernihiv, around Sumy, around the e even on the eastern suburbs of Kiev, that they've been pushed back somewhat from Kharkiv, which they were right on the gates of for weeks. So these gains in the east have been more than upset in terms of sheer percentage of territory held by the territory that is no longer occupied in the north. Now, you can get into semantics here between, well, did the Russians just control the roads or control the territory or whatnot? My point is the positions that the Russians are threatening, the control of the country they exercise, 
is nowhere near as unambiguously pro-Russian as people suggest. In fact, by this map, when people say, oh, well, they control 20% of Ukraine, they must be winning. Well, they controlled more than that, according to this analysis and some other maps back in March. And after three months of casualties, thousands of additional vehicles lost, many thousands of lives cut short or people wounded, controlling less territory than you did a couple of months ago doesn't exactly scream unambiguous victory. It doesn't say that Russia is losing, because we don't know what Russia for sure what Russia is setting out to achieve. But the map does not unambiguously prove that all is well on the Russian front. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if I had followed nothing of this war, you took both these maps, you blacked out the dates, you swapped them around, and you told me the one on the right was from March and the one on the uh, left was from June, so that they'd move from one map to the other, my response would be something like, wow, the Ukrainians have overcommitted counterattacking in the Donbass and they're about to lose Kiev and Chernihiv and Kharkiv. That would be a collapse for Ukrainian defensive efforts. But this discussion of this claim, just look at the map, does lead us to this point about how easily the narrative can change in the media without consequent evolutions on the ground. It's interesting to watch how the goalposts of success have moved for the Russians over time. Now, what I put up on the right there is actually a meme. This is a joke. This map was created as a joke, I believe, on non-credible defense as a subreddit, for example. And it then got picked up and Aristovich, one of the advisors to Zelensky, jokingly brought it up in one of his presentations to illustrate shrinking Russian objectives over time. The idea that in March we talked about the Russians taking Kharkiv and driving on to Dnipro, which we certainly were talking about in the early stages of the invasion and cutting off the entire east of the country and destroying everyone in the JFA. Uh, then in April, we were talking about a, a shallower encirclement that just destroyed Ukrainian forces in the joint forces area of the Donbass. And then May, okay, well, maybe they'll just take Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, which would cut off some of the Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. And this was made in May. And the joke then went, well, what are the Russians going to be trying by June? Are they just going to be trying so, like, something around Papasna and Bakhmut? Here we are at the end of June. And if you look at the right-hand side of that map, you'll see Lysychansk at the far right end. And the city of Sverodonetsk, which you've heard so much about all of this month, viciously fought over, is just to the east. It's the twin city of Lysychansk. This began as a joke, the idea that if the Russians would only be trying to take Bakhmut and cutting the whole area off, then that would be a horrific failure for the Russians. And in fact, they're actually just trying to take an area of territory that is smaller than that towards the end of June. And yet you will have noticed in the narrative, increasingly media saying, oh no, Russia is achieving successes. So to chart this out, in terms of just what the Western media has been saying, let's leave aside the Russian media for a moment. In February 24th, when the invasion kicks off, the Western narrative was basically Russia is going to take over Ukraine. Ukraine's going to collapse 72 hours. That's really a a, a figure that mostly comes from the Western media as opposed to from the pro-Russian one. But the idea was that there'll be an insurgency and eventually the Ukrainians will kick the Russians out because eventually the Russians won't be able to occupy whatever government they install will eventually be overthrown and they'll go insane and this will turn into the new Afghanistan. In March, it's, well, Russia is at the gates of Kyiv, but Jesus, have you seen how many tanks are being destroyed, how many APCs are being destroyed, how hard the Ukrainians are fighting? The Russian army isn't as strong as we thought they were. They're failing pretty badly. In April, well, we've withdrawn from Kyiv and we're now saying, okay, so Russia's going to try and destroy forces in the joint forces area. So that April or March encirclement line. But Ukraine is now winning because they've just retaken all of this territory around Kyiv. They're going to take back land around Kharkiv. Sumy is safe. Chernihiv is safe. By May, it's now, okay, Russia's just going to take just, the, they're just going to take the Donbass itself. But unless they also get to Odessa, really all they're doing is is saving face so they can claim a win. But by June, it's Russia's going to take Sverodonetsk by the 26th towards the end of the month. And as a result, Russia is winning. I don't bring this up to criticize anyone in particular, just to point out that it means that the narrative can become disconnected from the evolving um, situation on the ground. And then if you want to make an argument evaluating how well this conflict is going, Looking just at the map maybe may not be the best place to start. I guess what I'm saying is that we should be careful, in particular with recency bias. Um, I have two charts here. There are Bitcoin prices. The top chart shows that Bitcoin is going to the moon. That's making very significant gains over the course of a couple of days. You should put all your money into this crypto because while it's walking all over the place, it's gained significantly over the last couple of days. 
but that's just a few day extract out of this larger image that I've pointed below it. So if you look at it over six months, uh, well, you've actually done your money if you read Bitcoin. Again, this is not financial advice. I'm just pointing out that if you look at developments over a short period of time and you miss the bigger picture, you can be misled. And I sometimes feel that's happening when we do our evaluations of how the Ukraine-Russian war is proceeding. I mean, don't expect me to go on the Kremlin payroll anytime soon, but if I was going to construct an argument to argue Russia was doing well, I would focus on other metrics like claimed casualty figures or assertions around Western political will, rather than saying that the fall of a couple of villages in the eastern Donbass represents a major strategic victory that represents the change in the tide of the war. Because when you do that, you're ignoring what happened in February, in March, in May, or in April, and you're refusing to give context to what is now happening. So in summary on this point, Russian war plans are beyond the zone of certainty. No one can prove what the Russian war plans are, but working with the available evidence, we can make some reasoned guesses. And the evidence that we do have available to us suggests that what has happened is not really in line with the Russian plan. Firing generals, losing hardware, having to desperately and rapidly generate troops with seven days training and push them through on short-term contracts or calling up Roskvadia doesn't seem like the kind of thing you do if everything was going to according to plan. And even if we give the Russian plan some credence and assume that it wasn't built on the assumption that Ukraine would collapse politically, it seems to have been, but if you assume they just wanted it to collapse politically, and if it didn't, this was sort of like the fallback option, it does seem to have invested a lot of its military effort in the version of events where Zelensky flees, the Ukrainian government collapses, and Russia gets everything that it wanted. Kyiv was either not a feint or it was a terrible one. That is the position I'm taking with the evidence that I have available to me. And while I will always be open to additional evidence, I would rather not revisit this issue again unless new evidence comes to light. So Perun, I know you all will ask, does this mean Russia is losing? Does this mean Russia is winning? No, it doesn't mean either of those things. And as for whether or not Russia is going to be able to ultimately recover from the missteps of February, March, and April, I don't know. I simply do not have the information or expertise available to me to make those kinds of projections. I suspect part of the reason the narrative swings so wildly in the Western media is because of how quickly expectations of the Russian army have changed. The Western world built up Russia as a major threat. This was the army that would spend three days kicking NATO out of the Baltic. This is the army that could go to Berlin. This is the army that during the Cold War could do seven days to the Rhine, okay? And then the Russian army is pushed into a mission that it was not designed for and it failed to deliver in spectacular fashion. Kyiv was a disaster. The best executed part of the operation was the withdrawal, and that's pretty sad. So, of course, what happens with the media and observers is that everyone overcorrects by assuming, okay, this now means the Ukrainians are superhumans and the Russians are all idiots, and as a result, it is, it's still David and Goliath, it's just the roles of David and Goliath are swapped. The reality, I believe, is, is still what I've been arguing from the very start, that this is a much closer fight than any form of the narrative we had before the fight would suggest that Russia and Ukraine are much closer in terms of capability than we suggested before the war broke out, but that ultimately Russia is still Russia. It still has immense reserves of artillery and ordnance. It's still a nation of more than 100 million people with a pre-war defense budget that even if it was misallocated and riven by corruption, was still 10 times larger than Ukraine. And as a result, its army was much more capitalized. It has superiority in artillery and air power, and it's going to leverage those advantages to the hilt. So three days to Kyiv has become 90 days to Sverodonetsk, but that doesn't mean the Russian army doesn't still have teeth despite its failings, and it doesn't mean the Ukrainian army isn't battling against its own issues as well, even if it is much stronger than many suggested before this war broke out. So going forward, in terms of understanding this war, it probably demands sober, ongoing evaluation of both sides, keeping an eye out on what they do well what they do wrong, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what causes their reverses, what causes their successes, and analysing those. It's why I'm going to continue to look at issues like the employment of drones, issues of anti-tank missiles, infantry shortages, force design questions. I'm going to continue unpacking these issues because they help explain what we are seeing in terms of why the Russian military performs the way it does or why the Ukrainian military performs the way it does. So to close out, I can't prove why Russia went into Ukraine. We've all got some pretty clear ideas, but I'm pretty confident it wasn't biological warfare labs that were intending to use pigeons to develop, like send anthrax to Moscow or anything like that. 
We do have evidence to suggest that the plan was at least in part a regime change operation or a maximist war goals, and that it's not going according to plan. But at the same time, in chasing changing news to try and make sure that the war remains interesting and engaging, coverage has had a habit to sort of overhype every new system, every battlefield development, to give us a picture of a war that is changing a lot more quickly than it probably actually is. The war between Russia and Ukraine is an ugly, brutal, slogging fight with very high casualties, extensive use of artillery and fires, and relatively slow movements in terrain being taken or lost. The fundamentals of the conflict remain their fundamentals. Russia is still Russia, Ukraine is still Ukraine, and you're not going to have a situation where one tank ace or one superhero drops into the Donbass, 360 no-scopes the entire Russian army, and as a result, the Ukrainians are outside the gates of Moscow by mid-July. This war seems to have a long way to go, and it's no place for superheroes. And as a final point, I sure can't wait for the comments on this one. Because I've tried to cover a lot of ground relatively quickly, rather than deep diving a particular subject, I'm sure there's going to be some interesting thoughts coming out of this one. All right, channel update. And I've had to skip rebuttal of the week, um, if only because this video was already becoming one of the longer ones. Felt a bit long in tooth, so I thought it was worth to cut it. Instead, I'll jump straight to the channel update and I'll do rebuttal of the week next time. First thing to say is that the email submissions over the last week or so have been fantastic. I know I obviously don't get a chance to reply to them, but a lot of very good material came in ahead of the Mythbusting episode. Obviously, this episode was really driven by what my patrons wanted to see. So while we move back to regular content next week, This one was really built off what people wanted to see, and I'm thankful for the contributions that went into it. The second thing is, uh, funnily enough, scam alert. People are telling me you've made it on YouTube when people start trying to scam on your channel. Well, here they are. I put out a community post already warning that people were basically using my Perun logo and like trying to fake my name, but with symbols or add-ons instead of just the base name, and basically trying to reply to comments saying, hey, If you want some free merchandise, click here to give me all of your personal details and let me steal your identity or click over here to buy some dodgy crypto or, you know, send me a message on WhatsApp and I will sell you Perun coin or whatever or teach you the secret of making $30,000 a minute working from home or some shit. The thing I find really funny, which I have to call out here, is that on my community post about scams, there were a bunch of bots running a scam. So there you go. It's Scamception. Good on your YouTube, love to see it. So far as upcoming content, there's a number of videos that are in the production line. The topic of German rearmament and the German military has finally entered pre-production. I'm also looking at some additional Ukraine topics, in particular the role that artillery has played in the conflict, given how decisive it has been, and revisiting its role in military strength and investment decisions for other countries. I also have at least one collaboration project in the chain, but I'll talk more about that when the time comes. So far as sound quality goes, I need to apologize. The last episode's sound quality was horrible. I acknowledge that. My usual sound guy was traveling, so it was rather difficult. What I am doing is I have purchased and arranged for new microphone, new sound system. Hopefully that will help solve the problem somewhat, and we should have a new sound approach either for next week or at the very latest for the one after that. Other than that, my only comment is stay safe and thank you very much for your ongoing support. And also thank you to Ground News for their ongoing sponsorship and support. I particularly want to call out a number of the people who send me emails and updates uh, who are actually living in areas on the battlefield themselves, people who've sent me messages from the Russian side of the Donbass region, people who have been willing to take a risk to geolocate themselves, prove who they are, and provide some insights. I don't identify them, and I try to use what they tell me only in a general sense to inform what I am saying, but I appreciate the, the risks that people take in order to communicate and engage with me, and I hope that they all remain safe. As always, thank you very much for your comments and your engagement, and I'll see you all again.